I imagine some of you have already been down there to find some yummy goodies, but I know that there is more, and we would be so grateful if you'd support the Susanna Circle. You'll get to go home with a sweet treat, and any money that you donate today will go towards missions, both here locally and globally, through our United Methodist Women. We are very proud of the work they do, and I know that you'll want to support their missional efforts. Also, you'll see we have several groups meeting this week. Uh, the trustees committee, our grief group, choir practice, our puppet ministry, as well as our weekend backpack ministry. If you're looking for a place to connect, to build relationship, and to grow in faith, I suggest that you go join one of these groups this week, whether in service or in, uh, in prayer, and that you will be enriched by your time together. Also, I want to share a little challenge that we're going to make to our congregation for the next few weeks. Today we are reading from Paul's letter to Corinthians, the famous love chapter, and it got us here in the office thinking about Valentine's Day coming up. We recently were made aware of a new-ish resource at Millington Central Middle and High School called the Student Resource Center, the Family Resource Center. This is a small building uh, directly across the parking lot that is in front of the PAC Center where students or families can go to get a myriad of resources, emergency food, they can go to do their laundry, uh, to be connected to important uh, assistance programs, to have a safe place to go and study and spend time uh, getting ready for class and school. The Resource Center is a place that is serving our students and families in the community, and we want to extend the love of God that we're celebrating today, that spirit of love in the air as we approach Valentine's Day, by hosting a little drive for the Family Resource Center. They take many things for donations, but are especially looking for non-perishable food items, gently used coats and clothing, new underwear and bras, personal hygiene and feminine hygiene products, as well as school supplies. If you'd like to help us with this drive as we extend love to our community and to our students, you can drop off these donations through the next three Sundays in the Williams Hall Collection Closet. And on Sunday, February 13th, we will celebrate that drive and the supplies will deliver on Valentine's Day to the Resource Center. We are very proud of the partnership we have with our schools here at Millington First UI Methodist Church, and we received a note of thanks for one of the ways we supported our schools during the holiday season. We helped donate supplies for the student council that put together thank you bags of gratitude for the teachers and faculty and staff of the school and I received this note. Dear First United Methodist Church, thank you very much for your investment in our students and our families for the holidays and throughout the year. We value highly, we value you highly and are very grateful for your partnership in serving our students. Sincerely, Millington Schools. I know that we will show an outpouring of love and grace to our schools in this supply drive for the Resource Center, and I'm grateful for the investment this church is making in our community. Friends, with those announcements shared, I invite you to quiet your minds, to still your hearts, and to focus on the presence of the Holy Spirit here among us together as we now worship.
if you are able as we join in our call to worship. You can find this both printed in the bulletin and projected on the screen. We will read responsibly. Jesus is the light of the world. New hope has arisen for each of us. We are forgiven and blessed by the grace of Jesus. We are marked by God as disciples, the body of Christ. God has entrusted us with God's own message of hope. So come, Spirit of God, and rest upon us now. Enable us to be people of hope and peace. Amen. Good morning, and thank you, Elizabeth, for that beautiful prelude, God of grace and God of power, also known as God we owe thy great Jehovah. Our hymn of praise this morning is God of love and God of power. You can find it on page 578 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing all four verses. <laughs> Out in the grocery store. 
You see them at Thanksgiving? Very cool. Is there another holiday that you see in these candies? Valentine's Day. Ooh, are you guys getting ready for Valentine's Day? Are you already having lessons where you cut out lots of hearts at school? Yeah, no, not so much. But soon, when February comes, you'll be talking a lot about what on Valentine's Day? What do we talk about? Hearts? And what do hearts represent? Love. Love. You see, on these candies, one of the reasons I think they're so popular during Valentine's Day, which they are hearts, and they have messages of love on them. They say things like cutie pie and be mine and best friend, and you give them to someone you love. So I share these with you all. I love you, and I'm so glad you're here. But I have another message of love to share, not only the message on these candies, but today in the Bible, we hear from a teacher called Paul, who was a man who lived a very long time ago, who loved Jesus very much and taught us more about Jesus and God. And he shared with the church a message of love. So I want to share that message to, with you. You see, Paul had some friends in a city called Corinth. And those people, they had a lot of good ideas, but sometimes they forgot what was most important, and that was love. And Paul wanted to help them remember, so Paul told them, if I use words that everyone understands, but I don't have love, then I'm just like a clanging bell or a booming drum making noise. If I teach people about God and know what will happen tomorrow, if I know everything there is to know, and I can figure out all of the mysteries of the world, but I don't know anything about love, then none of the other things that I know matter. And if I sell everything I have, and I give money to the people who need it, the poor, but I don't have love in my heart, I am nothing, nothing at all. And then Paul, he told us what God's love looks like. Paul said, love is easygoing and kind. It never wants what it can't have. It doesn't brag. It's not rude. It's not selfish. It doesn't get angry. And love always forgives. Love is happy with the truth. Love always protects. It trusts and hopes. Love doesn't give up. It never fails. Paul told his friends, today we only know a little bit about God's love, like the little hearts in your box. We just know a little bit about God's love, but he said, one day we are going to know everything about God's love, and we're going to be reminded that God loved us so much that God sent Jesus to teach us about that love, and God asked us to share that love with others. I wonder... How do you know someone loves you? On Valentine's Day, we share love with candy or cards, but in your regular life, how do you know that someone loves you? Yes, Mom? You they give you a hug? Yeah, that's a very good way to know if someone loves you. What's another way to know if someone loves you? Okay, you can keep it in your head. How do you know your parents love you? How do you know that? Jesus loves you, that is right, Macy. You know, we know our parents love us, one, because they tell us, but also they take care of us. And God takes care of us, which is one of the ways that we know that God loves us. And when we take care of other people, when we give them hugs, or when we help them feel better when they're having a bad day, we share God's love. So you got a message of love today, but you can be a reminder of God's love in the world. With the kind things you do, when you choose to be patient, when someone's getting on your nerves, and you just take a step back and stay calm. When you give to others, especially if you have something you really wanted, but you give it to someone else so that they can enjoy it. Those are ways that we share love. So friends, I'm going to invite you to uh, bow your head, to fold your hands, you can put your candy right next to you. And we're going to pray together to be God's love in the world. Will you pray by repeating after me? Dear God, thank you for the gift of love. A gift we know through Jesus. Who loved us so much. 
that he laid down his life so we would know that nothing can separate us from your love. As we share messages of love in the world, Help us remember, every time we're kind, every time we're patient, every time we are full of joy, we are sharing your love with others. Help us do this every day, because we love you so much. And we want the whole world to love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, make sure you grab your candy and you can head with Miss Missy to Children's Church or back to sit with your parents or grandparents. Our next hymn this morning is I Love You, Lord. It can be found in the Faith We Sing hymnal, page 2068, where the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing it through one time. You may remain seated.
we'll pray for her healing journey. Yes, Rhonda. I'd like to ask for prayers for James's mom and for James. Um, her name is Ivy Jones, and this past year was really, well, she's been declining in health and everything, and this past year was really rough. She lost two of her sons, and then she just found out her last sibling passed away this morning at oh. four. And we've really been struggling trying to get her, I can mean, have a room for her, and she won't let it from her home. Mm-hmm. And we can't keep other, there's, she has two other siblings, but they live out of town. And so it's all on James. And I just want prayers for him because we're really trying to figure out if we try to move her from her home, she's going to kick and scream. And we don't mm-hmm. want that either, but we don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, she doesn't want a whole lot of people helping her. And, you know, it's just difficult. And so if you mm-hmm. just pray, <laughs> <laughs> pray for both of them and for, you know, give us, help us with the solution. Oh, we're just really worried, you know, we, I begged her last Saturday, and we just don't know what else to do. We'll be praying for Miss Ida, uh, for her heart in a season of grief, and also for James and you as you care for her the best you can. Yes? I would like prayers for the Prosser family. Um, Mrs. Donna Prosser passed away this weekend at a long-term leader in this community. Yes, we extend our Christian sympathy to the Purser family, uh, give thanks for her uh, long and faithful life, and pray for, for them to experience God's peace in this moment of sadness. Yes, Stephen. Uh, I have kind of a silly prayer, but you know, I'm going to miss all of your prayers, so I've got to blow things up for a small drop. So, uh, my knees out, I've got no crush, I want to change, they've got my shoulder out. Uh, my whole back is hurting because of walking around lopsided. Last night, a tooth broke off. Last night, I woke up with my, with my toes hurt. And I got down under the cover, and I have laying there in the bed. I split my two big toenails. And they were bleeding out. When I'm on a prayer, and it sounds funny, but it's serious. I want my parts to get along with each other. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll be praying that the Spirit can bind your body together in unity uh, and for your healing uh, journey. Seriously, Sam, we pray for your comfort. Friends, with those prayer concerns and joys shared for the laughter that we've had together, and also the moments um, of great heartfelt yearning um, and searching. Let's go now to the Lord in prayer. Lord of love, Lord of power, we give thanks that we experience your power through that same love. That the power that you have shown in the world, God, is one of creativity, That as we gaze across creation, as we see the beautiful earth, the animals, even ourselves that you created and called very good, we see your love in action, all things working together to live in peace and unity. And yet, God, in this moment of prayer, we confess that often we have chosen to pull away from that unity and peace, which is your vision for the world. We hurt one another. We isolate ourselves. And God, in this moment, we pray that your grace, your peace, your love would invade our hearts and would bind us back together, that we might be a witness of your love to the world. God, in these moments of prayer together, as we lift up the joys and concerns of our hearts, we glimpse the community that is possible when we come together to support one another, to laugh with each other, to cry with each other, to hold on and hug one another when our tears and words no longer suffice the pain in our hearts. And God, even when it is difficult, 
We are grateful that you have given us the gift of community, for we are not called to do this life alone, but to lean on one another. And so, God, as we support each other, we lift up to you these prayers that we have offered out loud, knowing also that we lift up to you silent prayers of our hearts and minds, and that you have heard each and every one of them, and that you are already working to weave your grace and your peace back into our life and experience, and that your spirit present here with us in this room is inviting us to open our hearts, open our eyes, open our arms a little wider so that we might begin to be the answer to the prayers we've lifted today. Not that we can fix our own situation, God, but that we can be empowered by your spirit to live with a love that heals the world. And so God, in this moment of worship, as we're gathered together as the family of Christ, Wrap us in the arms of your love, for we need to feel your healing touch. Your healing touch over those for whom we've prayed, and your healing touch in our heart and lives as well. As we offer our worship to you, as we sing songs of praise, as we pray to you throughout this hour, as we hear your word and we ponder upon it, Lord, humble our hearts. Teach us patience and touch us with your kindness. Open our eyes that we may see ourselves as you see us, beloved children. Open our hearts to your spirit of gentleness that our words may be true and our love may be pure. And as a community of faith, bind us together in a love that does not fail or fade so that we may bear these things together, and that we might hope in your love, which never ends. Source of truth and love, you sent your Son to teach us about your heart, to invite us to reflect your love in the world. And as Jesus came to be with us, he taught us this certain prayer to help guide our hearts and minds and to work for your kingdom. And so as we pray these words, help us hear them anew today. Help us recommit ourselves to what this prayer asks of us, and help us do all of this in love as we pray the prayer which Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to ask you to help us out on our congregational special music this morning. It's called The Gift of Love, and it can be found on page 408 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. I know we did it last week, but as Pastor Amanda shared with you, with us last week, this hymn was sung at their wedding. So let us have a repeat performance of The Gift of Love. You may remain seated if you'll sing out. <laughs>
that beautiful hymn captures the essence of the scripture that we'll share this morning. Chapter 13 from Paul's letter to the church at Corinth. A passage that is very familiar to us, but, with, but a passage that also holds such depth and wisdom and truth that it's good that we return to it often. So here, friends, about God's love, the gift of the Spirit given to each of us. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I am a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all the mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and I hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. For love is patient. Love is kind. It isn't jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It doesn't seek its own advantage. It isn't irritable. It doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, trusts in all things, hopes for all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As for prophecies, they will be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I put an end to childish things. Now we see reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, and love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Will you pray with me, and will you pray for me? God of love, by your grace, I ask that you would draw me beneath the shadow of your cross. That is what that what is heard today are not my words, but yours. And what is felt in all of our hearts are not our own desires, but your will, O oh Lord, for you and you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. It was 1965 when Jackie DeShannon, a young girl born and raised in Hazel, Kentucky, a small town of about 400 people, just a few hours northeast of where you and I are sitting this morning. It was 1965 when Jackie first sang these words. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. In a year that saw the first U.S. combat troops land in Vietnam, in a year that watched Dr. King march with 2,600 other individuals in Selma, Alabama for voting rights, the world needed to hear, needed to believe in the possibility of more love. Since then, these almost immortal words have been sung, have been prayed, have been hoped by musical artists and fans singing all over the world. For us, in 2022, more than 50 years later, the message is no less timely. Already this year, we have witnessed hate and action as a gunman targeted a Jewish congregation in Texas and held four people hostage for nearly 11 hours at Congregation Beth Israel. While, by God's grace, all four hostages escaped Without physical injury, certainly there will be long-lasting emotional, psychological, and spiritual scars 
for this congregation and for our Jewish brothers and sisters everywhere when they reflect that the evil of anti-Semitism still exists and endangers them today. Right now, our world needs more love. And just days before this attack, here in Tennessee, the McMinn County School Board voted to ban the book Mouse, a graphic novel detailing the horrors and atrocities of the Holocaust. And this vote that was taken in January, the same month in which we observe International Holocaust Remembrance Day, while board members cited foul language as the primary reason for the ban, they overlooked the continued need to educate our children and our young people about the dangers of hatred and prejudice to warn of the evil that can be perpetuated when hatred finds its way into power. And so right now, our world needs more love. The Apostle Paul knew that. The Apostle Paul knew that the world needed more love. He knew that the church in Corinth needed more love. And so he sat down to write these 13 verses that we read this morning. More often than not, when we hear these words from 1 Corinthians, we hear them at weddings, moments when we celebrate the best of what love can be. We often hear these words read in the context of hope as a prayer of blessing over the new union of two lives joined together in love. And most of the time, because we hear these words at weddings, the patient and kind love that we think about when we hear and when we read this passage, well, we can tend to separate that love completely from the troubles of the world. We keep that kind of love on a pedestal, put it in a shrine for wedding days and anniversaries and celebrations and then we may not think of it too often on the in-between days when life is hard, when the world is weary, when our patience is running thin. But it's those kind of moments exactly when we need to turn back to those words about love. Remember a few weeks ago when we started this journey in 1 Corinthians together, we discovered that the church that Paul was writing to, the church in Corinth, well, they were a community embroiled in messy conflict. They were fighting with one another, arguing about who was better, who was more Christian. And they were in a place where they needed desperately to be reminded of the love and the unity that they shared in Christ. And so we might boo and awe at the words that Paul wrote about love today, for they are beautiful. But I imagine that these words for the Corinthian Christians, they were the kind of words in a sermon that hit too close to home for comfort. The kind of truth that stung just a little bit. And for us, perhaps, these words from Paul, they've become so familiar that we don't feel the same sting. We overlook that maybe it's our toes that Paul needs to step on too. Perhaps this 13th chapter from 1 Corinthians, what so many of us call the love chapter, maybe it's become too familiar, so that it's easy to hear it read and to nod our heads along and smile and think, how beautiful, but completely miss the truth that should amaze us, the truth that should overwhelm us completely and bring us to our knees when we really admit just how difficult, in fact, how dang near impossible it is to live with this sort of love in our daily lives. Paul says, if I speak without love, I am nothing. But what if we heard his words this way? If I approach the enemy on the other side of the political aisle without love, then I am nothing. I'm as out of place as a symbol crashing in the middle of a moment of silence. If I look at someone who is different from me, a different race, a different orientation, a different ethnicity, a different socioeconomic level, a different education status, if I look at those different from me with anything other than love, then I have nothing. I am morally, spiritually bankrupt. When you put it like that, with those words, well, that's when it feels like Paul is starting to step on my toes. What about you? 
Paul is trying to show the Corinthian Christians, Paul is trying to show us that there is a more excellent way to live than the ways that we divide ourselves, than the ways that we argue with one another, than the walls and boundaries that we build. Paul is trying to show us the more excellent way of God's love, a love that will change us, a love that will challenge us, a love that will inspire us to be our best. And as Paul continues to describe this more excellent way of God's love and what it looks like in the world, his words are inspiring and uplifting. They are. Yet even more than the opening lines in this chapter, the verses that describe love's characteristics, its qualities, they're so well known to us that their familiarity threatens their beauty. It diminishes their wonder and amazement at the sort of love that we've come to know through faith, the sort of love that God loves us with. For me, when words of scripture feel too familiar, when I think I've got them all figured out and I already know exactly what they mean, that's when I know I have some praying and searching and studying to do for God's spirit is breathed into the words of the Bible. It makes it alive. It refreshes and renews our insights every time we turn to read it. The Spirit's constantly surprising us. And so when I don't see anything new among familiar passages, often I'll turn to a different translation, one that's different from what I'm used to reading, one that will use different words to share the same deep truth. And so I thought today we could do that together, that we could take a moment to read this familiar passage with less than familiar words. So as you hear the middle part of this chapter again, the description of love, but this time from the message translation, listen with fresh ears, with a fresh mind, with a fresh heart. Listen and imagine, where have I encountered this kind of love in my life and in the world? Ask yourself, when have I embodied this kind of love, if only for a moment? And begin to pray, God, let me live with this kind of love, the way that you love. Here again, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 8. Love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for itself. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. Love isn't always me first. Love doesn't fly off the handle. It doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Love doesn't revel when others grovel. Love takes pleasure in the flowering of the truth. Love puts up with anything. Love trusts God always. Love always looks for the best. Love never looks back, but keeps going to the end. If that kind of love is the faithful fruit that you and I, that we're expected to bear in our lives, evidence of our transformation in Jesus' name, the mark of our salvation, then we all have some work to do, don't we? But what if more than just describing our call to love as disciples, Paul is also describing to us the love that he has found in Jesus Christ. Yes, this love list, it is still aspirational, which means that I think the Apostle Paul wants us to read these words and think, yes, that's how I want to live my life. How can I do that? But I also think Paul is more than just offering us qualities of the kind of love we can embody as a checklist to decide who's right and who's wrong when it comes to living and loving through faith. I think Paul is also describing the gift of love that has been offered to each of us through Jesus Christ, the kind of love Jesus came to give us, a love that never gave up on us, a love that instead of keeping the score of our sins, or the weight of the cross so that we might be set free. The love that offers us salvation. 
When we talk about salvation, we most often, and maybe too often, we talk about it in terms of what we're saved from. That we're saved from sin. That we're saved from condemnation. That we're saved from suffering the absence of God's presence. And when we manage to talk about what we're saved for, we often focus on the future and what we'll experience. The someday paradise of eternity. The promised reality that hasn't been fully realized yet when God's kingdom will be as real on earth as it is in heaven right now. But what if Paul is introducing us to an even better way of understanding salvation? What if Paul is giving us a new answer to the age-old question, what difference does Jesus make in my life today? It's clear to me that Paul wants us to know we are saved for so much more than a someday future reality. Yes, we have been saved and given the promise that we will one day dwell fully in God's presence, and that is good news. But Paul is also teaching us that we have been saved right here and right now to love. Through Christ's love displayed through the ultimate sacrifice of his love on the cross, we have been set free. And not only that, but we have been set free for a purpose. We have been set free to be empowered, equipped, and enabled by the Holy Spirit to love. To love God. To love each other. To love the stranger. To love ourselves. That's what it means to be saved. To say yes to God's love and to be on the journey of letting love be the guide for all we think, all we say, and all we do. Now, living with the love of Christ, that, living with the love that Christ exhibited in His life, the love that Paul describes here in Corinthians, that's not easy, friends. You know that. To lead with patient, kind, selfless, giving love. To grow until our hearts are so full of that kind of love that there's not room for anything else. That's going to take major work in each of us. In all of us. Some days it may seem that the transformational work of love, it's so hard and it's so slow that we might be tempted to give up. To wonder what difference it will really make in the end. Aren't we just one person? One family, one congregation, one community. Even if we did cultivate this kind of love in our lives, what about all the other acts of hatred, violence, and evil that we see in the world around us? Madeline LaEngle, a writer and a Christian, wrote in her memoir, I do not think that it is naive to think that it is the tiny, particular acts of love and joy which are going to swing the balance. Yes, we may all have a long way to go before our lives are completely guided by the agape love of Christ, but that doesn't mean that the small ways that we live into this love right now don't matter in the end. In fact, these small wins, they are glimpses of God's kingdom at work. I thought over the past few months, where have I seen a glimpse of that love at work in the world? Where have I seen the promise that God's love wins in the end? Where have I seen people living into selfless, giving, patient, and kind love? A few weeks ago, on a Monday, over $12 million was raised across the country for animal shelters in the memory of Betty White. In the memory of a woman whose care and love for animals, part of God's good creation, inspired others to share love. On Facebook, I saw that a colleague of mine from seminary, Angela, that she was in charge of the Valentine's party craft for her daughter's school. And so she created a sheet of paper with a reflective mirror sticker with notes of affirmation all around the edges Never give up, believe in yourself, and the reminder to each and every child, you are loved. In our own congregation, week in and week out, we feed the neighbors of our community through our food pantry, through our backpack ministry. We love our neighbors. 
Through our creation care ministry, we seek to live in ways that will love future generations and leave them the good gift of God's creation. As I see the smiles on our congregation's face as our children run down to children's time, as we share in joyful and youthful laughter and gaze in wonder at the simple but profound insights of our children's face, I know that we are loving our children, that we are loving them to know that they belong here in this moment of worship just as much as any adult. And I've glimpsed the love of God through your overwhelming response of love and support for members of our own community when they were experiencing tragedy or hardship, through the flood buckets that we sent to Waverly, through the love offering that we sent to other United Methodists who have lost their churches in tornadoes, through the outpouring of love that I know you'll share in our Valentine's Drive for the School Family Resource Center. Friends, I know that you know how to love one another with God's love, and that you love this community with the love of Christ. These love-filled actions are signs of the spirit-filled, spirit-gifted community that Paul has been speaking about in his letter to the church at Corinth. These acts of love are a foretaste of, a witness to God's final purpose for the world, for the world to be restored to God's original design of love. Yes, we all have some work to do, and we'll have work to do tomorrow, too, to live more and more with the love of Christ. And yes, there is real hate and evil to overcome in the world and in our own hearts. But we are called today to strive together for the greater gift of love, to become the kind of love in action in our lives that we hear Paul speak about today. For whenever we glimpse the work of love, Christ's love, in our hearts, in our community, even when it seems fragile or temporary, even when it only happens over here or over there, now or then, whenever we glimpse that sort of love, we have glimpsed God's new creation, and we are reminded that in God, love never ends. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is I Stand Amazed in the Presence. It can be found on page 371 in the United Methodist Hymnal, or the words are projected on the screen. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Please stand if you're able.
uh, after many, many years here in the Millington community. I know that uh, Coach Woods here has uh, taught many of your children throughout the years, and we are grateful uh, that he continues that legacy of teaching and investing in the lives of young people at CBHS. <laughs> And while we send them to this next chapter of their life with some sadness, we are grateful for the love we've shared together. And so we seek to send them with blessing. If you'll join me with the insert in your bulletin. Friends, the church is a family united by the common recognition of Jesus Christ as our Savior. We are all brothers and sisters. And for a time, Millington First United Methodist Church is our home. Like every human family, our church family is formed and reformed over time. As members are born, as they die, as members are adopted into our family, and as they leave our congregation for a new home in a different place. For a time, Keith, Sherry, and Chandler Wood have lived with us. We have shared with each other good times and bad. We have shared each other's joys and sorrows. We have lightened each other's loads. Together we have laughed and cried. Together we have worshipped and praised God. Together we have lived. Let's join. We feel sorrow in your leaving, yet we rejoice with you in anticipation of this new phase of your life. We will miss your love and support, yet we know you will add much to the lives of those who will be your new church family, as you have added much to our lives. We will pray for you and for the whole family of God. Friends, let us pray blessing over the Wood family. Oh God, you are the strength and the protector of your people. We humbly place in your hands Keith, Sherry, and Chandler, who are about to leave us. Keep and preserve them, O oh Lord, in all health and safety, both of body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, go in the peace of Christ, knowing our prayers go with you. Amen. We're grateful they're just moving to East Memphis, so we know we'll see them around every now and then, but we want them to invest in the community that they've moved to and to be uh, the great neighbors we've known them to be in Millington. Friends, as we prepare to go out led by the light of Christ, will you join me in our benediction, both printed in the bulletin and projected on the screen? People of hope. Go with peace into the world that God loves. And as you go, shine the light of Jesus on all whom you meet. We go into the world to answer God's call. We will live as the body of Christ. Amen.